Put your hands together for a big white horse welcome for Mr. Martin Brennan. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's really nice to be back. In relation to the moral of the story, uh, the reason there were thousands of hits on that video is I come from a very large family. <laughs> and everyone under five got five pence for pressing the button, so not many of them looked at it. I want to introduce one prop I have tonight. I'm just calling him uh, John Brainchild, or John Brainiac, and there's been lots of stuff written about him. Um, humanistic psychology, uh, neuropsychology, existentialism. Uh, cognitive behavioural therapy, but they all seem to have one thing in common from where I look from, is that there seems to be a relationship between what goes in here and what happens as a result. And I want to use that as a backdrop to talk tonight about fears, maybe normal day-to-day -day fears. Um, asking for that date, um, looking at a presentation and doing it, uh, writing the book, starting my own company, taking on an aggressive person at work, all of those items that in some cases perhaps we put off for a while and maybe when we get stronger, we'll attend to them. And it's not going to be a negative conversation. I want to look first at maybe how fear will kick in and then swap it around and see what we could do to change some of the tapes so as to be more effective and manage it. There'll be no Superman stuff. Cop yourself on, be brave. There's none of that stuff here. It's basically saying if you can manage the fear or if you can eradicate it, it should certainly help you to be more effective. I'll just put Jack down. Um, or John. <laughs> okay. Interesting point, you know, when you look at some of the fears. Fear itself is a good thing. It regulates our behavior and it makes sure that we don't do anything to the detriment of our health or our company. It sort of keeps us within parameters. But what if, what if fear becomes dysfunctional? What if fear drives my activity? And what happens if it paralyzes me a bit? And wouldn't it be nice to move from the paralysis of fear to perhaps to the flexibility that can be garnered from just managing it or overcoming it? And what I'd like to do is perhaps talk about maybe what happens in here when the brain is looking at these fears. And then perhaps look at ways in which we can adjust the tapes within so as to take on the boogeyman and adjust the thought process so that we can be more effective as we live our lives and as we take those challenges that we so want to achieve and those challenges that will make the difference for us between success and failure. Do you know I was taken tonight when I watch people in the nibbles and having the grub? Which is always a great thing about an egg night, isn't it? There's some good uh, nosh and if nothing else goes right, at least the food is lovely. <laughs> but what's interesting is that when I saw people um, I can't move out of there. I saw people, and as they were nibbling, I became very aware of a fear that I've had all my life. And it was the fear of having my food stolen. <laughs> now, I come from a family of 14, so you can see where this goes, right? And in a lot of cases, there was always a chance that a sibling could rob your food. Coincidentally, food that I had already robbed from another sibling. <laughs> Morality is a funny thing, isn't it? And I often feel that in some ways it kind of made us resourceful as a result. And I often thought as well it might be a very good sort of movie for Attenborough, the life in our house with such a fear. I could just see, you know, uh, the 12 stone urchin on the stairwell, uh, Hurley in one hand, two sliced pans in the other, and he's been surrounded by a rabid pride of siblings. What does he do? and he decides to do the best thing possible. He fends them off with the hurley and eats the bread while he can. All those happy memories. And it's interesting as well, you know, you'll notice, if I could just have the cup aid on if you don't mind, you'll notice that they, my, my cup, that people who come from a big family, you never take a saucer. The reason you don't take a saucer is because you can't hunt when you're trying to balance a saucer and a cup. And you probably look around, anybody who has a cup only tonight is probably from eight plus. I come from a family of 14. Okay, uh, we're one short of an international rugby team, but we're still working on that. The other interesting one as well, when you come from the big family, is that, you know, you sort of know how to be resourceful. So if you can imagine, some people from a big family, they'll actually butter bread on their hand like this, standing up. And what happens is if you have 14 people milling around the table, you can actually reach in and take a piece of bread, and then you reach in with a bit of butter, and then you butter it on the run. Sometimes if it's really bad, you reach in for the butter, butter your hand, and slap the hand on the bit of bread, and then take it from there. The reason I'm saying that is that not all fear is bad, and sometimes it can lead to being resourceful. And sometimes when you look back on it, we call it the good old days. 
It was interesting when I was putting the talk together on natural fears, normal fears. And I started to experience over the last couple of weeks a lot of the things that I wanted to talk about. In fact, I had a dream the other night as to what would happen when Adon asked me to do the talk. It started off well. Martin, will you do the talk? I will be delighted to do the talk. And of course, then I start writing my notes. This is looking pretty good. And then Sandra, Sandra Quinn in tonight, no? Sandra did an interview, and it's even better. But then Sandra shows the photographs of myself and Pat, Pat Dively. And then it's getting near the date. And I look at Pat Dively, handsome looking dude. He's got a stomach like a washboard. He's been on the television, he's blogging. And here am I saying to myself, Jesus, what have I got to offer here tonight? And that's what happens. You start kicking now into a thing called Lolo. Lock on, lock out. And I was locking on to the negative side of what was going to happen tonight. And I was locking out all the positive pieces of the performance or of the story I had to tell. And because the brain always moves you towards what you think about, what happened is that I was getting more nervous, more frightened, riddled with fear. And then the next piece kicks in, doubt. And for my money, doubt has killed more dreams than failure ever will. And because I was doubting myself, I started getting into a thing called creative avoidance. Maybe if I could make this gig go away. I thought about burning down the white horse. <laughs> At least getting a job done on the white horse. I tried the measles, but I had them before. But I really was trying to get out of this. And in the middle of all this, Adon rang me in the dream and said, Martin, how are you fixed? Well, Adon, I'm feeling a bit tired, actually. I've not been well lately, hoping that he'd let me go. Are you okay for the night? Well, I have an aunt visiting from Cork, and I haven't seen her in three weeks, so I might have to talk to her. He challenges me. Martin, they're looking forward to it. I take a fight with him, and I end it. I sabotage myself so I don't have to do the talk. And I walk away kind of happy. I haven't been rejected. I haven't been a failure. But I'm living in the twilight of, Jesus, I could have done that. And I didn't do it. And if it can happen for a presentation, it can happen for other stuff as well. No negative connotations here. Just trying to paint the picture before we challenge. And it could be that presentation at work. It could be going for that job, building the business. It could be trying to form that relationship. It could be asserting my views in the management team. But what's interesting is if the doubt creeps in, we tend to drive with a self-talk that is really trading off mediocrity for potential. And we start then to regulate our lives sometimes based on that uh, mediocrity as opposed to striving for, even though it's uncertain, the striving for success. So before jumping in and moving on, I just want to maybe overview what might happen in the thought process to make these kind of thoughts happen and to make us on the one hand feel worried and doubtful while on the other hand uh, we could actually be resourceful and optimistic. Lou Tice, I don't know if you ever came across him, he's a wonderful psychologist. Uh, he died recently, a brilliant man, uh, used a lot of his psychology to help prisoners and help communities. But the one thing I took away from him is that if you look at all of what was on John Brainiac's head, his approach described the thought process in three simple areas, the conscious, the subconscious, and the creative subconscious. I hope you're all in the conscious as we speak. Okay, if you're not, please don't snore. But the interesting one is that when we're in the conscious, what happens is this. We start interacting, and we even take stuff from the subconscious as part of that interaction. But all of these interactions come together, and they're stored on our subconscious. And they form a picture overall of who we are. But here's an interesting point. The brain will always store without edit. You're no good at this. I'm no good at this. He's better than me. He's better than me. And when the brain stores without edit, it's an interesting point. You'll hear it in IT parlance. Garbage in, garbage out. And that's why you'll see people, when they do things, you think they're mad, but all they're doing is they're being consistent to their own garbage. And that can happen to all of us. And of course, the reticular activating system or the creative part of the conscious mind will say the following. I've got to ensure that you act in accordance with how you see yourself. So the reticular activating system down here in the back of the brain, its job is essentially to look for ways in which I can achieve my goal, even if you've never seen those ways before. Do you ever go to sell your car or buy a car and suddenly they're everywhere? Up to yesterday, they weren't in. But now that I've got a goal, 
that particular part of the brain will give me awareness of those items. If I was to ask you in this room, how many double electrical sockets are in this building? Now, please don't say you know. You shouldn't know. And if you do know, get medical help immediately. But if I said to you, I give you one grand if you could tell me how many medical sockets are in this building, I guarantee you, you'll see them up here. There's one up here. There's one down there. Because when you set yourself a goal, the brain kicks in. But what if my goal is around doubt? What if my goal is around I'm not able or I'm worried or I'm not as good as him? The same reticular activating system or creative subconscious will ensure that you move towards that picture, even though it's bad for you. And here's an interesting challenge point, uh, folks, is that unless you change the tape, you will continue to go back there. That's why each of us will have neurotic fears that we take on the journey. But on a very serious note, you meet, might see somebody who had an abusive childhood and suddenly that person is in an abusive relationship and people say, he's mad. He's not mad. He's been consistent to the tape that he has in here. It's better to be beaten up than to be dead. And that's how the tape goes. And that's the extreme version. But for all the other pieces where at times our potential could have just been beautiful, there may be times when we sabotage ourselves to ensure that the picture of self is consistent without ever challenging that particular picture. Hope that makes sense. And that's how it works. But then to look at how do the thoughts come in and what impact do the thoughts make? They can be positive or negative. So you'll hear things like, uh, you're very good at this. You're not cut out for that. I'm better than him. I've been jilted. Whatever. There's messages come in. But now, when you multiply them by the following, who gave me that message? How important was it? Where did it happen? In front of whom? What's the future look like? Is it positive or is it negative? And now you can see how the taping is starting. And as it goes in, we will act accordingly. I'm not talking straight away. I'm talking over a period of time how these things happen. But if they're in there, well then, with a fear, for example, of, say, presenting, well then what can happen is that physically I might get the dry mouth or the sweaty palms, fight or flight, or try to burn down the hotel. But psychologically what can happen as well is that I'm doing a negative self-run. It may not work out. I'm not good at this. He's better than I am. I wish my mammy was here. But the interesting point is that that diet then leads to the following. It leads to the following in the sense that you become risk averse, creatively avoidant. You might low low, lock onto the negative and lock out the positive. And, but that's not the worst piece that can happen as a result of that. Because what about people who depended on you, or me, and they were let down or frustrated by you not keeping your side of the bargain? Um, what about a situation at work where you didn't get that promotion? or you didn't start a company, or you didn't build a company. And all of those can be sort of uh, secondary and extra implications coming from me having a negative diet and not knowing how to change it. So you might say to yourself, can that be changed? And I think it can. And please feel free. And I always say at any sessions that we're doing, agree or disagree tonight. It's only stuff. But the reason I think it can be challenged is because if you look at the reticular activating system moving us towards the picture that we have inside, well, what about the following? What if we could change the picture and made it a more resourceful one? And that I did look at words like beautiful and different and unique as opposed to horrible and awful and failure. Because the way the brain works is quite funny. The brain sometimes doesn't differentiate between reality and real reality. As long as the message that goes in is imaginative and vivid and is fueled by experience, the brain will take it on board. Okay? And if you can imagine for a second how this works, imagination times vividness. Close your eyes for a second. Okay, please close your eyes. If you hear anybody near your belt, it's your wallet being stolen. It's part of the show, okay? <laughs> but could I ask you to imagine a time, any time, say holidays this year. Did you go abroad? If you're caught talking to yourself, that's quite okay. Did you go abroad? Um, could you walk down some boulevard or some place where you were 
and say you're with friends, which friend is to your left? Don't look back in it, look at it now. Which friend is to your left? Which friend is to your right? What about your children if they're with you? Where's your youngest baby? What's she wearing? What's he wearing? Where's your loved one in your life? What's he or she wearing? If you're in a hot place, can you feel the heat? Can you feel the atmosphere? And enjoy that for a second, but when you're ready, come back. Isn't it interesting? Let's take an image of being on holidays in Spain. Well, it's fair to say that 30 seconds ago, I was in Spain. But it's fair to say that 30 seconds ago, I was physically here. But the brain doesn't matter. It doesn't differentiate between contrived reality and reality. That's a very, very important point. Because if we can write to the brain in such a way that we have enough vividness and imagination to make a picture on the brain, the reticular activating system will move us towards it. Look what can happen at work, if you see this example working. Take a bad day at work. Didn't go well, didn't perform so well. And suddenly you go back and you talk to yourself. Negative evaluation, negative affirmations, self-criticism, putting myself down, low self-image, negative picture. Could you imagine on that day if somebody asked you to do a talk to CIT on the beauties of your job? Believe me, you would be creatively avoidant because you're not resourced to do it. But now look at the same brain. Next day, you get a call from your manager or from a colleague or from another company with whom you work and say, brilliant job. Same brain. Positive evaluation. Positive affirmation. Positive self-image. Self-praise. Positive picture. Now, isn't that interesting? The same brain, and by the way, I'm not advocating here tonight positive mental attitude and deny the fact that there's a lot of lousy stuff happening in the world. What I am saying is that if you look at what happens with the negative uh, approach and the negative self-image, as opposed to the positive self-image, the positive self-image is much more resourceful. It's much happier. It's much more enabling. It's much more powerful. And sometimes what can happen, instead of going through your life and saying, I'll stay in the positive only, no. Accept that bad things can happen. Accept that mistakes can happen. Accept that I don't perform all the time at my best. But what about the following? Every time things are going well, that's just like me. Everything, something is not going well, anytime it's not going well, you don't deny it. That's not like me. But the next time, I'll be better. You see what's happening here is that the brain is now attracting to the future positive as opposed to clinging to the past negative. And there's hope because now you can make mistakes and as long as you're going in the right journey, you can ensure that you're going in the right direction, that mistakes are okay because you're learning from them and next time, next time. But look what happens here, folks. You're deliberately changing your self-talk into a more resourceful state. The brain does not care. The job of the reticular activating system is to seek out areas where you can live that state, where you can be in that state. And of course, as it goes well, just like me. If it doesn't go so well, that's not like me. I did make a mistake, and I do accept it, but next time, next time, next time. And as that picture becomes stronger, the reticular activating system will move you towards that particular experience to reinforce it and action on it. Could I just ask the audience a question? Um, I'm not looking for any life-threatening fear, and if there's police involved, I don't want to hear about it either. But anybody like to shout out or even think to yourself, Lolo, creative avoidance, doubt. Has anybody in the room, sort of in normal day-to-day -day work, um, had the impact of those on them? Anybody like to shout out, not compulsory? but it would severely help the laxative effect up here. <laughs> Anybody like to share a presentation or anything that, yeah, I did get into that zone? Okay. Uh, yeah, and I suppose, and it's not to have a Q&A in that sense, guys, but that dream I told you about earlier, that was a real dream. As in, you are worried. And isn't it f uh, really funny that when we're working with people and we're trying to help them, Ever before we meet them, they're the enemy. 
It's only when you get to meet the nice people that you sort of come around again. But before that, there can be a lot of negative resources sort of go in there. Okay. If you think of anything, uh, please bring it up later on. There's no problem. Is everybody okay with the idea that uh, you go, and this is how the brain works, and because of the way it works, when thought processes go in there, unedited, in a lot of cases, we can find ourselves in situations that don't always serve us the best. Can we do something about it? Yes, we can, by appreciating that imagination times vividness equals reality for the brain. And by using a situation where we accept what's going well, challenging what's not going well, but reinforce it by next time I will be better, you have a hope of changing the states and taking on those fears. So could I ask you to imagine for a second, again, close your eyes. Okay, imagine if you have one of the fears I'm talking about, uh, be it a presentation, um, be it a relationship problem that I just want to have the courage to say something, but I don't. Uh, be it a circumstance at work where I want to be more bold and committed. Uh, be it a circumstance at work where I want to take on a negative, aggressive person, but I'm worried about same. Whatever it is, they're just a few prompters. But let's now use the psychology of the thought process to tackle that particular um, fear. Firstly, what name would you give it? Is it my fear of? Uh, its impact on me, is it big? Is it small? Here's an interesting point. If it's small, imagine all that worry up to now, it was a small impact. So at least the exercise of checking it has made a lot of sense. Is it small or big? What would it be the impact on me if I didn't have this fear? What would I look like? What would I perform like? How would people look at me? How would they respect me differently? What if I looked at the strengths that I know I have and I listed those strengths in a way to overcome that fear, be it presentation, be it assertiveness, whatever. And suddenly I start thinking about strengths that I do have and can use in abundance. And here's the cracker one. What if I could use empowering positive statements which describe me without that fear? Which describe me without that fear. So when you're ready to come back, and the reason I want you to close your eyes there is I just didn't want to throw it at you, oh, these fears are easily overcome. But what I wanted to say is that the very exercise of sitting down and asking yourself the questions can lead to a couple of things. One, it wasn't as big as I thought. And two, even if it is, I have resources. Now maybe the tapes in here up to now have stopped me from using those resources. But what? What if I could just use those resources to change the tape and to change my state? The one I'd like to attach attention to are those positive statements. You may have heard the term affirmations. We affirm somebody. We confirm somebody. But my friend Lou Tice, he used to always say an affirmation is a goal statement written in the present tense as though achieved. Isn't that brilliant? As though achieved. I'm giving up the cigarettes, that's my goal. I'm a non-smoker. Oh no, you are. Oh, yes, I am. I'm a non-smoker. That's the starting point because we've got to get the brain working on it. I'm an innovative speaker. I'm a loving husband. I'm a great friend. I'm an approachable manager. And it's to imagine what these statements would be like as written in the present tense, as though achieved, but also written in such a way that they make a tape on the subconscious. And hopefully you've guessed it. If there's a tape on the subconscious, the reticular activating system will move us towards the tape. So don't write statements like the following. I am a nice person. Yeah. I'm a good dad. Hmm. What about I am an exciting, approachable dad and I love spending time with my kids to help them in the areas where they need development? How about I'm an approachable boss and I make time every week for the individual members of my team? What you say, I'm a gutsy, ballsy person, I'm going to write that book. But you're doing it in such a way that the statement will have imagination times vividness and it's connecting to the central part of the brain, to the subconscious, and therefore you have a chance. You have a chance of the reticular activating system moving you towards it. Since we're not having a conversation, would you close your eyes again? And we'll try a couple of uh, the tapes themselves.
Okay, could you just imagine, close your eyes. First thing I'd ask is this. In relation to any fear that I have, and by the way, interesting thing about fears, every human being, we do things for reasons valid to ourselves. I'm frightened. You tell me to cop on is not no good. That's my own fear. So think of the fear for a second, but now switch it. Think of a statement that would describe you without that fear. Think of a statement that would describe you as being more resourceful. Example, I'm an innovative communicator. I integrate into any group easily, confidently, and at ease. Wow. Hold that for a second. I'm a loving dad. I work with each of my kids to ensure that they get the best of my attention so that they can develop. I know that I'm a valued member of the management team and my views are sought because they're good views. I never fail on the night because I ensure that I prepare for success. Do you see the point? That you're seeing yourself in that area. You're seeing yourself resourced. And when you do so, the imagination times vividness, that's what you've got to do, is to ensure that that imprints it onto the brain. Stay with that for a second, if you don't mind, and just try and imagine the following. In the imagery that you're using, say it's loving children. Say it's at work with a presentation. Go with your kids and play. Go into work and see the people right now in your imagery applauding. Go to your boss's office and see the handshake to say that you've been getting a performance bonus. That's what you need, folks. Because up to now, some of the crap that was stored through imagination times vividness is well worked in. All we're trying to do is to compete with some of it so that we can give ourselves a good shot at changing that particular approach. Stay with it for a sec and just see if you can imagine those pieces. And as you're imagining them, the important point here is this. As you're imagining them, feel the dopamine, feel the happiness. God, wouldn't that be nice? Because the most important piece about challenging fear is this. Switch it. What would it look like if I didn't have it? What would I look like if I was the opposite? Now write a statement for yourself which describes that opposite. But do it in such a way that's imaginative and vivid. Now put it onto your brain. And once it's onto the brain, you got the wonderful activity of the reticular activating system working on your behalf. You cannot fail. If you haven't fallen asleep, will you please come back? Everyone get the idea? Okay, so the last piece then is that how do you get something to imprint onto the brain? Remember up to now, some of the self-talk that we had has taken some time to happen. The one I used the last time when I was here is, you're just like your Uncle Tommy and he's a gobshite. Okay, and the interesting point here is that if there's a vivid challenge, it's the vividness and the imagination that imprints it onto the brain. So what you need to do is if you've got statements that you can use to change your resourcefulness, to change the state that you're in, well then, maybe early morning, maybe late evening, sit down. And there'll be three or four other statements about other aspects of your life as well, perhaps. And sit down and close your eyes. And when you close your eyes, try to imagine the feelings that go with that positive statement you've written. Try to imagine the people. Try to imagine the positive challenges and the way you overcome things. And the brain will do the rest. The brain will do the rest because within hours, you'll start seeing opportunities opportunities for that particular one to come through. And as it starts to happen, I made that presentation just like me. It didn't go as well as I thought, but next time I'll be better. But at least the brain is resourced for looking at positivity rather than dwelling in that perpetual twilight of, ah, oh, gee, I can't. As opposed to, maybe I can't, but I'm going to give it a go. That we are trading potential success, in this case, for mediocrity. And when you sometimes hear folks, you are unique, you are different, you are wonderful, you are beautiful, that's where it's coming from. People who don't buy that say the opposite. And you can see it in their face. John Cleese said one time, it was really lovely, he said, after the age of 40, you get the face you deserve. <laughs> and I think that's well put, and it sort of should show some of the stuff. So interesting last point, 
that if you have some of the thoughts, and by the way, don't be worried about saying, I would love to be better at this. Well, write the statement that can show you in all the perfection and glory and success of that new approach. Let the brain do the rest. It's an act of faith. People say to me, Martin, that's very interesting, all that positive stuff. But I wouldn't try that. He's proving my point. Because his affirmation is, I won't try that. And lo and behold, he's a success. But so am I. And I prefer to have my success than his success in that particular example. Give it a chance. Give it a chance. Give yourself about a fortnight. Repeat it on a regular basis. Not just one. You could introduce other affirmations for other parts of your life. But you'll then start seeing it happen. After about a fortnight, you'll see the results. But get feedback. It was a great presentation. Uh, I really liked your opinion at the meeting. Um, all of those items which confirm that you're going in a particular direction. And then from there, let the action commence, so to speak. I think it was John F. Kennedy said once that the best time to fix a leak in the roof is in the summer. And when you think of it, how many of us end up in the middle of the winter doing those stupid jobs? And with that in mind, here are a few tips for summer work on the mental talk. Okay? And I suppose the first one is this. When did you last sit down and make out a list of the strengths, facilities, abilities, and positive feedback that I receive from other people? Or when did you last get feedback like that and say, shucks, instead of writing it down? That's the first piece. Most negative affirmations can be overpowered by resourcing with positive instead. So write it down. That's a nice exercise, a cup of coffee and maybe half an hour. And a great way to find out your strengths are as follows. Look at what you've achieved over the last 12 months. Say, write down 10 items. Talk to yourself about them. And I guarantee when you're finished about that talking and finished on the talking, you will see the strengths starting to emerge. And you know why? Because there's great evidence in our successes of our strength. Because we tend to use them. It's a great exercise. I guarantee you, when you finish, you'll feel good. The next one is perhaps maybe look at a coach or a mentor. Not coach or mentor in this sense, just at work. A buddy, a friend, somebody with whom you can shoot the breeze. And say, look, I'm feeling up or I'm feeling down, but use it as a resource, so to speak. Another tip I think is useful are some things like this. It on, you've single-handedly, over the last four or five years, helped all of us to lead better lives, be better in business. And I think you'll agree, with the Monday morning, we get the notes, uh, these events. And it's a network of like-minded colleagues who are sort of resourcing each other as a result of attendance. And thanks. No, thank you. <laughs> and so the next piece is maybe just be resilient. It's not working now, but it could work later. Just stick with the plan, so to speak. Failure is an option. If you're trying to overcome a fear and it's not working, as long as you're going in the right direction, you're doing okay. Because sometimes a person may be driving to Dublin by bus. That's where they should be going. But they decide to drive by fast car to Tralee. Now, if the bus breaks down in Port Leash, you're still going in the right direction. No matter how good the car is on the way to Tralee, you're in the wrong place. So failure is an option in that sense. And the last technique I want to show you is a thing called flip back, flip forward. It's a, a little dopamine rush, so to speak. And here's how it works. Imagine for a second, you're going into that meeting which you fear. Imagine for a second, you're starting that presentation and you want to overcome the heebie-jeebies, so to speak. Imagine you want to tell somebody close to you something very significant, but you're getting up the courage to do so. Here's what you do. Close your eyes, and if you do it for a second, I'll show you the technique. Close your eyes, and go back to a time in your life, now, last week, last year, or whenever, when you felt really, really successful and happy. It could have been the person you're with, it could have been an award at work, it could have been an exam. But just go to that particular thought process now and stay with me. Don't look back at it. Go into it. What were the results like? How did I feel? What about people close to me? How did they sort of tell me that I did well and congratulate me? What about the people at work when they applauded my achievements? Or people close to me, my mother, father, my wife, husband, they felt really good for me. Don't look back at it. Be in the middle of it. I'm feeling good. That was a great result. I'm really good at this. 
Now open your eyes. And now go to the meeting. Because what happens is because you're feeling well, some of the dopamines with the transmitters in the brain will start feeling well anyway, but the positive self-talk will be taken up by the reticular activating system and drive you on. And by the way, if it works, you can use the same event all the time. It's brilliant that way. You don't have to think up of something good every week if you're going into a meeting. Use that one and use the resourcefulness of it, so to speak, um, as you're going to the meeting or making that challenge. Folks, I'm nearly there. Uh, thank you for listening. And I suppose what I try to show is that fear is normal. It's when it becomes dysfunctional and makes us fear our abilities that it's abnormal. And by changing some tapes and approaches, we can at least challenge it or harness it for the better. To do that, you need to know how the brain is working. Most important piece is this. Whatever garbage goes in, goes out. Whatever goodness goes in, goes out. What's wrong with a diet of goodness? And then when you look at that, is to appreciate some of the tapes that come into your life. And some of those tapes, depending on who said them and the importance placed on them, can have a negative impact. And the reticular activating system will, without edit, and unwittingly take you towards it. Unless you change the tape, you don't change the future. And the great thing about positive psychology is that you can look to your past but the past does not have to shape your future. Change the tape, change the future. And then when you look at that to be aware of how the brain sometimes does not differentiate between reality and reality, as long as something is imagined enough and fed in there with a, a sense of optimism and a sense of passion, the reticular activating system will take it on. The most important message I'd love to show you and give you tonight is the following. Number one, what? would I like to be like? What would I look like at my very best? Now write a positive and strong statement which describes that and repeat it often and visualize how you look and how you feel and what you see and who sees you. And let the reticular activating or the creative side of the subconscious do the rest. My sense is that if you face the fear, you control the journey, you influence the journey. I have a little exercise I want to do, but just before we do so, uh, can I thank you for listening? I hope that you got something to take away, and thanks very much for listening, as I say. God bless. <laughs>